My name is Katja Edson, and my co-director is Hector David Rosales, and we did the Masks Up PSA, The Stripper. And it shows you that in Miami you can take off everything except common sense. Hey everybody, welcome to Talks Miami, a collaboration between Locust Projects and Ulite Arts. Before I say a little bit about our guest tonight, who is such a good friend and somebody I've known for a very long time, I want to give you a couple of uh, good housekeeping uh, information. So coming soon at Locust Projects is the next show is going to be uh, Metatomera, and there are also going to be videos by Janine Antoni and Stefan Petriano and another video by Paula Wilson. Uh, at Ulite Arts, we got a space now on Lincoln Road, and we're gonna do a show called Materialize. And it's gonna be an exhibition uh, that's gonna be curated by uh, our good friend Megan up at the Arts Center of Hollywood. I'm really excited about that. And I hope some of you have felt in the, in the ether uh, the project we just did, the PSAs, we just showed you one, about everybody putting their masks up. And we would love it if you guys would come and vote for your favorite PSA. And you can do that at Ulite Arts slash Masks Up. And uh, we would appreciate that. Our guest tonight is Nicholas Baum, the director and chief curator of the Public Art Fund. He's an Aussie, but he doesn't sound like one anymore. And when I think about Nicholas, like I said, because I've known him for so long, I really two things come to mind. He's really, really brave as a curator. He kind of listens with his eyes, and there are, that's not always true for the curatorial practice. And secondly, he empowers artists to do amazing things, uh, which I think is the highest compliment I can give to a curator. So uh, he's at the Public Art Fund now. He's working on a ton of projects. He's going to give us a little bit of a tour through his career, which has been uh, really extraordinary. He's done so many shows, and so many important artists have worked with him. So without further ado, Locust Projects and Blue Light Arts bring you my friend, Nicholas Baum. Dennis, uh, what a lovely, warm welcome. I, I'm very touched. and. Uh, the only thing I'm I'm sorry is that I'm not getting to to be with you in Miami in person. Um, uh, we we go back a long way, uh, as do Laurie uh, and I as well. I, I've worked with with both of you uh, on different projects and um, and in fact, when I was talking with Laurie about what to uh, what to do and talk about. Uh, I, as a you know, curator and, and working at Public Art Fund, I'm always thinking about you know, our latest projects and what we're doing. And Laurie said, well, that's great, but we also want to know a little bit about kind of how you got here and what are some of the influences that have, uh, that have brought you to where you are. And, and in fact, um, that, as I've thought about that, I've thought about how important mentors are in my career. And some of that will be evident in the images I show. And, and I think, Dennis, uh, you've been a mentor of mine. And uh, I, I so appreciate that and, uh, and look forward to, to continuing the dialogue on, on so many you know, shared passions and artists and interests. And uh, I, I really admire the work you're doing now at Ulight uh, and that Laurie is doing at Locust and, and this fantastic partnership. So uh, I'll be there in Miami soon um, and, uh, and really appreciate the invitation for tonight. So, um, so maybe let's, let's just sort of jump in. Um, 
And, and as Dennis mentioned, uh, I'm going to move on to, to the slides. Um, and Dennis mentioned that I am Australian and uh, I grew up in Sydney. And this is, uh, and when I thought about, you know, influences and artists, uh, here's one from when I was four years old. Um, I promise I won't give you something from every year or you'll be here all night. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the work of Christo uh, and Christo and Jean-Claude, um, who did one of their most important early projects in Sydney in 1969, invited by John Caldor, uh, an amazing mentor of mine, uh, also a mutual friend um, of Dennis's. And, um, and Christo and Jean-Claude came to Australia uh, to, to create this work, The Wrapped Coast. And uh, I was four years old. I, of course, didn't really have any clue about what was going on. Uh, but this was a transformational event in the um, sort of cultural and artistic life of of Sydney and Australia, and it represented a moment where um, distance and uh, and the international art world were no longer incompatible with with Australia being a place to make amazing work. Uh, and this was, of course, all about artists dreaming up new ways of creating work of making work on site, responding to a site, creating work outside the galleries, outside their studios. And, uh, and, and so this, this moment um, was an important one. And, and I guess it had an extra resonance for me because um, John Caldor, who was the uh, Hungarian emigre Aussie who who had invited Christo and, and Jean-Claude uh, was actually my next door neighbor. So I grew up with, with this influence very much uh, as, as a part of my life. Um, I, I move then to, um, I think just, just a few years later, um, 1972, and another kind of pivotal moment in, in uh, the art world in Australia and, and I think in, in the way I thought about and understood what art could be and what it could mean. And, and this is the work of uh, an Indigenous Australian artist, uh, Clifford Possum, and, and this was, he was one of the very, um, early group of artists that began to paint uh, on uh, paint using acrylic uh, materials and on you know, uh, board and, and canvas eventually. And, and in that sense, took a, uh, a kind of traditional practice of sand, sand painting, which if you think about the central desert, uh, the Western Desert in Australia. Um, this is a, an Aboriginal man from a community that, um, you know, that live, lives in one of the most remote parts of Australia. Uh, and trees are very hard to come by. We know that in the northern part of Australia, there are uh, paintings on bark from, you know, sourced from trees. But in central Australia, in the central desert, um, if your art practice relies on having bark and trees, there's not going to be too many. So, um, but this, this, I think, was a fascinating and important moment because it also, uh, I mean, it gave a voice and a presence in the broader cultural dialogue in Australia that Aboriginal people had really been excluded from. This, this art movement that developed uh, really was a way to assert 
the land rights and the cultural continuity and the power of the, the Aboriginal culture that had been marginalised. And, uh, and this has sort of continued to develop and, and I think been one of the most extraordinary movements to happen in contemporary art. Um, so uh, making that switch from being seen as sort of an ethnographic uh, practice to something uh, that's really a part of a, a vibrant, diverse and multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, art world. So uh, that idea about animating different voices, about art being able to be a platform um, for that cultural expression, that political expression, ultimately, I think was also a big influence on me growing up. Um, so, um, then um, this uh, sort of jumps, jumps forward um, to the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut which is the, the first museum that I joined um, uh, following sort of my, my early career in Australia where I worked at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney uh, and also with John Caldor and his collection. Um, and I wanted to show the slide of the building because um, I think what I have learned, a lot of what I've learned and been influenced by uh, comes from artists. And I think if you think of Christo or if you think of Clifford Possum or if you think of, you know, um, so many artists that, uh, that I've been influenced by, they have made their work uh, in a very close dialogue with context, with time and place. And and they've adapted and responded and created a dialogue. And I think for me, going to a museum that was um, this very historic place, uh, historic collection, uh, one of the oldest museums in the United States named the Wadsworth Athenaeum before they even used the word museum, um, but doing contemporary art there was sort of a challenge to think, what does it mean? How can that opportunity be responsive to this place and this context? So um, one of the exhibitions that I did there was uh, on Sol LeWitt's Incomplete Open Cube series. And, uh, and that exhibition was installed not in the sort of white cube space of the contemporary gallery, but actually throughout the historic collections of the museum, so that the dialogue between uh, LeWitt's extraordinary uh, serial conceptual work could have with uh, old masters and the statuary and the architecture of that uh, extraordinary 19th century museum. Um, and LeWitt, another figure who has been a tremendous inspiration and influence um, uh, certainly on my thinking about art and, and its potential. Um, the next museum I worked at was the ICA in Boston. And this is actually the, uh, the home of the ICA in Boston when I joined, which was the old firehouse building on Boylston Street uh, in the Back Bay. Um, and uh, it's now the architectural college on the, le on the left. That's where the ICA was. And um, of course, now it has a magnificent new building that I was very excited to, to be involved with. And, uh, but when I started, we had the old building. Um, it was a historic building, but the inside had been completely gutted and, and transformed. And the interior was a 1970s kind of split level open space. Uh, we knew that we were leaving. That space had been 
you know, by that point was, was um, you know, in need of renovation, but because we were doing a new building, uh, that space um, really had no need to be preserved. So again, thinking about what we could do there uh, that, that would make it really interesting as a dialogue with an artist. Um, one of the shows, and I apologize for the, the grainy slides here, um, was with Kai Althoff, the, the Cologne um, art, German artist. And uh, what I was able to do with him was sort of say, um, you can use the entire museum as your canvas. Uh, you can do an installation that uses uh, the, the walls, the stairs, the, the balustrades, the ceilings. You know, you can really um, take over the space. There's no need to be precious about this kind of white cube, uh, which, which it never was. Um, and Kai was the sort of artist who just uh, thrives on that kind of installation context and created a really dazzling kaleidoscopic installation of, of his works with a, this very interesting multicolored um, setting. And, and a big inspiration of Kai's is actually the 1970s and looking back at that period. So, so in fact, the marriage of that 70s renovated interior in a historic building um, proved to be a, a, a really exciting one. Um, you know, fast forwarding then to the new building on the waterfront in Boston, which uh, is, is, of course, just a transformation of the ICA and that institution and, uh, and the opportunity to then work in this sort of pristine new space, which could not have been more different uh, from the old one, um, led me to think then uh, about working with an artist like Anish Kapoor, um, where we had the opportunity to, to use, you know, huge open gallery, uh, 5,000 square feet with natural light um, to place sculpture and uh, not even to use walls, but, but to use the works themselves um, to create the, the, the spatial experiences um, of this kind of wonderful new gallery space. Um, and uh, uh, Anish was, was uh, extraordinary to work with and also understand uh, how an artist could really take on a challenge like um, this kind of vast open space and, and transform it into something very poetic and, and you know, really very beautiful. Uh, and, and at the same time, echo the building uh, and that sense that Dilla Scafidio and Renfro had of a, of a sort of machine for perception that that building in a sense is. Okay, so um, so so then um, the next the next step for me um, was uh, moving to Public Art Fund to take on the the directorship and chief curatorship at at Public Art Fund, and um, I think one of the things that uh, that I brought to to this role. Um, of course, was my museum background. And it struck me at the time that, um, of course, one of the amazing things that a public art piece can do um, is something very site specific, uh, a commission. Obviously, the tradition of public art is, is of sort of civic structures and monuments. If, if we go back, you know, to the Arch of Constantine and and beyond, um, but, uh, but I, it also struck me that it was interesting to think about public space as a, as a venue for, uh, for, for the kind of curatorial thinking that we typically see in museums. So 
why couldn't we also do shows that maybe we're looking at um, a, a thematic moment, a zeitgeist, what's going on uh, with a group of artists and, and could that be presented or a monographic show of a single artist that you would expect to see in a museum, but see that in a public space. And I think the platform that the Public Art Fund has, um, has given me uh, and my colleagues there is sort of the, the platform to sort of think expansively about what public art exhibitions can be. And that's a fantastic tradition that the Public Art Fund has been building for you know, 42 plus years, um, 43 plus years. Um, so, and I should say too, um, and it applies to all of the exhibitions that I've mentioned so far, um, my work as a curator is only possible because of the the teamwork, the collaborations, the partnerships and the institutions that foster that practice. Um, the partnerships with artists, the, the trust and the dialogue that they have with us. But, you know, every exhibition is, is a team effort. And, uh, and I'm profoundly grateful for the, um, you know, the extraordinary teams and partners and colleagues that I've gotten to work with um, at every level, um, staff, board, leadership, um, you know, all of those things come together uh, to really support what we do and make it possible. So, um, so that's, some, that's something really important, I think, to, to think about too. Um, so, one of the exhibitions that I did, um, uh, so my first group show at City Hall Park, one of Public Art Fund's regular venues in New York, was sort of thinking about um, what, what's a way of, uh, of creating a thematic exhibition in a public, excuse me, public space where you don't have those tools that a museum has of wall text, of a resource room, of docents, um, all of those interpretive tools that museums rely on to present a theme or a concept or, or a biography. And um, so whatever we do has to be very legible. Uh, in a way, you have to sort of get it without having to read a lot. Um, and, and so I think public art has that sort of interesting challenge of, of legibility, which at the same time is not about kind of dumbing anything down. And I think artists show time and again that they can work in an authentic way, um, but in a way that's also accessible and open on many, many levels. So, so public space, what do we normally find in parks? Statues. Uh, and this was a moment when a lot of artists were thinking about the figure in a way that figurative sculpture hadn't been the focus for a long time in the kind of minimal pop, conceptual, post-minimal period. Um, but an artist like Huma Baba um, creating work that taps into, you know, traditions of, uh, of figurative sculpture going back to ancient Egypt, but sort of somehow collided with, you know, with Mad Max and, and found objects um, collaged together. Um, or Pavel Altama from Poland, uh, working with the Noelipi group, uh, rethinking what, um, you know, what statuary might be with this idea that I brought it together under the, the notion of statuesque. Um, but these aren't quite statues, but there's a dialogue, uh, there's a dialogue going on with that interesting history of a genre and a, a space, you know, this, this public space that we share. 
uh, Rebecca Warren with um, her sort of striding figure kind of walking into the park, um, leading, leading visitors into that space. Um, Tom Hausiger with his sort of towering uh, red man figure right outside of, of City Hall. Uh, so, you know, finding ways to, to play with those traditions that, that no one needs to have explained, uh, but that artists are mining and thinking about and exploring in new ways. Um, fast forward to, uh, to a much more recent exhibition and um, a very special one for Public Art Fund because we did it uh, really in um in in to mark the 40th anniversary of the organization uh in in 2017 so founded by doris friedman a really visionary civic uh leader and, and cultural activist and and someone who understood that art and artists should be a part of our civic dialogue in a way that wasn't an accepted notion at that time. Um, and so that tradition uh, is something that we live every day. And um, you know, Doris's daughter, Susan, is, is still president of Public Art Fund. And um, we, we have this kind of wonderful tradition and lineage that, that, uh, that we can draw on and continue to build on. Um, so for that 40th anniversary moment, we wanted to do something um, that, uh, that enabled the city to be a platform, uh, that enabled us to, to work uh, in, in some of the regular sites that Public Art Fund is, is known for working in, um, as well as, you know, to have work really throughout the city. And I, we were thrilled that, that this exhibition um, and that Ai Weiwei's vision for it embraced all five boroughs. And in fact, uh, there were more than 300 locations for the exhibition. Um, and what I think was really fascinating and, and is another interesting challenge if we think about that notion of legibility that a public work, that a public art exhibition has to have a kind of legibility that doesn't assume uh, a certain level of knowledge or history, that it's going to be seen by people from all walks of life and all ages and, uh, and, and is, is, um, is going to have to be permeable to that in different ways. Um, now, that's an interesting challenge in itself, but if that artist's work is also taking on uh, a topical issue, you know, something that's in the world, that's a kind of, that's a, a, a topic of discussion, that's a contentious topic of discussion, um, which of course for Ai Weiwei, um, at that moment was the refugee crisis, the, the global refugee crisis. And, um, and it, it was not only about the, uh, the refugees being put in, in camps and in centers and in, uh, 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 you know, confined behind fences literally behind wire fences um, in the Mediterranean, in Europe, um, and of course, in the context of a discussion of, in the US about building walls and dividing people from each other. Um, so for Weiwei, uh, he was very interested in this challenge that I you know, gave him to, to take on a, a special exhibition and project to mark our 40th anniversary. And he understood right away that it, 
it needed to be woven into the fabric of the city, but that he also wanted to make it um, about this very urgent issue that he felt about very passionately. So I think one of the super interesting uh, challenges, and, and the exhibition, of course, was called Good Fences Make Good Neighbours, which was really, um, you know, borrowing the line from that Robert Frost poem and using it um, in its kind of ironic sense as, as, it, as it is used in that poem um, to think about um, the small-mindedness of that idea that, that a fence um, can successfully divide people. And um, the exhibition, as I mentioned, was all over the, the city. This just gives a sense of you know, some of the, the ways that um, exhibition uh, moved, you know, beyond Manhattan and, and into the different boroughs and um, was, was using sculpture, was using, um, uh, was using bus shelters, was using advertising spaces, was using um, banners uh, on, on lampposts uh, and and sort of in locations that were familiar and locations that were very surprising. Um, and probably one of the most prominent and remarked on locations was Washington Square Park uh, and this work simply called Arch um, under the Washington Square or sort of nestled into the Washington Square Arch. So back to this sort of interesting question then about if you need to make a work of art um, very legible, but you also are interested in this political conversation, um, that, that kind of adds another layer. And until this exhibition opened, I really wasn't aware, I wasn't sure. I mean, I, I understood and I felt that it would be uh, a very powerful exhibition. But what I didn't know was, would people understand it intuitively? Um, you know, this is a work that it doesn't have text. Um, it doesn't have a big explanatory, you know, wall right there that, that sort of tells you what it is or what it's about. Um, and, and yet, I think as soon as this work took its place, um, everybody understood immediately what this work was about uh, and the idea of cages, of fences, and of being able to break through that um, in the context of this wonderful image of, of a sort of symbolic entryway to New York, this city of, of immigrants, of Ellis Island, of the Statue of Liberty, of that extraordinary tradition, and even the, you know, the layers of indigenous history on which all of that is built. Um, people understood that on a very intuitive level. And I think that's an incredibly difficult thing to achieve. Um, and, and I think is, is why this uh, exhibition was, was such a success and um, such an important exhibition for that moment uh, and for Ai Weiwei and I think for, for Public Art Fund. And, and again, sort of creating different models of what a major public art exhibition can be. And, and of course, this dialogue with, uh, with history and with the monuments um, that, that, uh, that we've had the opportunity to, to create and work with uh, a number of times. Um, okay, so I wanna, um, move now to talk about this, this past year, which um, 
uh, has, has sort of been an extraordinary one on so many levels. And uh, uh, it's, it's actually a year in which Public Art Fund has found itself um, in a very surprising position. Um, I, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that we would find ourselves as um, one of the only cultural organizations able to continue to operate in New York City. But of course, when the, the lockdowns and restrictions and closures happened as a result of the pandemic, um, the only spaces that were left open were our public spaces, our parks, uh, those public spaces, our basic public infrastructure. Um, those things remained. And so the work that, that we do was suddenly the only work that could be done. And, and it's been a, a humbling and an extraordinary thing to, to sort of find ourselves in that situation um, and to, to have the opportunity to respond to that and to try and continue to work with artists uh, and to, to share our work with audiences throughout the pandemic. And, um, and at the same time, we had been working on uh, a major new project of a, of a different kind, um, which was a, a series of permanent installations. You know, what I've talked about so far have been public art funds, um, sort of ongoing program of temporary exhibitions, like a museum's special exhibition program that take place in New York City. Um, but we've recently also undertaken a series of major partnerships where um, we're working with uh, a another um, organization to commission public, permanent public work. So um, this is LaGuardia, this is the new terminal, uh, um, Terminal B at LaGuardia Airport, which, um, which opened during the pandemic and which we were uh, well into the, uh, the preparations for and had been working on uh, for a very long time uh, to create four major permanent installations um, uh, by four e extraordinary artists. And, here you see um, Sarah Z's work, uh, Shorter Than the Day. Um, and when everything shut down, um, the governor uh, determined that because the airport is essential infrastructure, that the construction must continue, that the airport had to open, and thus Public Art Fund became literally and, and a part of the essential workforce. And so we continued to work uh, hand in hand with our artists um, to, to realize and install these amazing works. And, um, and I, I suspect that not many of you have had the chance to go to the new LaGuardia terminal yet, but uh, you will. And this, this work will be here permanently, and it is really extraordinary. And I'm so proud of, of what the artists and, uh, and, and our team was able to accomplish. So um, uh, this view of, of Sarah's work gives you a sense of that. To the right, um, you see this extraordinary um, wall piece, which is a tile installation 400 feet long, um, but, but we'll get to that in a minute. This is a detail shot of Sarah's work, which is um, all photographs of the sky above the airport and, uh, and through the course of a day. So it's like a timepiece uh, from dawn and, until dusk. But each one of these photographs is actually 
it looks like a torn piece of paper. It's actually printed on metal and then suspended in this extraordinary spherical sculptural form. And that's looking up at it from below. And there you see uh, the Law Owens uh, mural in the background. So this sort of wonderful dialogue between these works. Um, Laura's piece is called um, I Pizza New York um, or I Pizza Emoji New York. Uh, of course, it's a play on the idea of I Heart New York. Um, there are pizzas in this amazing work and it's a, a kind of assemblage of icons of New York City that the artist um, kind of put together and, and created a sky space of clouds floating in a blue sky uh, with motifs drawn from all five boroughs uh, and of course Queens where the airport, uh, LaGuardia Airport is, is located. But, um, you know, um, uh, items from, uh, you know, iconic landmarks, um, as well as just everyday things like food carts or uh, the coffee cup, the Anthora coffee cup or uh, um, a Metro card, um, uh, an ice cream, um, you know, van with a dispenser. You can see one of the pizza slices floating up to the left there. Um, subway signs, um, references to other public artworks, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, um, you see the winged, um, figure from Grand Central in this image as well. Um, just an amazing sort of collage of images and stories that, that collectively represent and evoke the spirit of New York City and this extraordinary place. And I come back to that theme of context and how artists are always using that and, and sort of responding to that and my own uh, influence. So, um, uh, and here you see a wonderful detail that shows this kind of use of tile, different sizes, different colors, uh, all just extraordinary, all hand laid, uh, just an epic undertaking. Um, we're sort of running short of time. So um, this is another one of the extraordinary pieces that's at LaGuardia, Sabine Hornig, who created this uh, extraordinary um, photo collage on, on this sort of connecting space between the car park and the terminal, her own over a thousand photographs woven together, um, a kind of sky, a, a, a sort of a um, skyline that's night and day that's inverted and, and, and growing up uh, at the same time using quotes from Fiorello LaGuardia, which have an, an extraordinary resonance today. Um, so that's, that's extraordinary. And then Yepa Hine, um, whose wonderful benches and, uh, and, and balloons, mirrored balloons, are sort of peppered through the, uh, the higher level um, of, the, of the new terminal as a sort of wonderful breadcrumb trail leading you through the airport. Um, so, um, so we were able to, to accomplish that, but we also wanted to do something that really responded to um, the moment at, at the height of the pandemic in New York, when we realized that, um, that we had this possibility of doing something uh, that, that, that could reach out to artists. So we did this exhibition called Art on the Grid, uh, the grid being New York City, um, inviting 50 emerging artists to create works to respond to the moment the moment that started with, with the pandemic, um, but that, uh, of course, became also um, uh, a, you know, with George Floyd's murder, uh, a, a reckoning, a national reckoning about race and um, 
you know, the uprisings and the, and the movements and the activism that was happening. So, so this, this became um, an opportunity to build on what we had done with Ai Weiwei using bus shelters and our amazing partners at JC Deco, um, who, who together with NYC and Co gave us 500 bus shelters and 3,000 digital kiosks all throughout New York City that we could show these artists' works um, all over the city. And, and they all responded in their own ways, um, some very uh, joyful and, and expressive, others um, with a, a kind of potency of the moment. Jordan Castile here, um, with uh, the image of, of uh, a young man on the subway, very distinctively New York subway, with just the baseball cap saying Minnesota. Um, so leaving you know no question as to as to what this meant uh, at this sort of moment of incredible um, you know uh, power and 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 political gesture. Um, Adam Khalil, extraordinary indigenous artist, um, you know, creating work and, and you know, finding really um, these extraordinary urban settings. I just love, this was an amazing juxtaposition, a, a sort of double bus shelter um, with on the left-hand side, the work of D'Angelo uh, Lava Williams um, called Undetectable, two black men embracing and kissing through masks. Um, and then on, on the other side, Elizabeth Bick um, with Hawk Snipes and their mother, Mary Snipes. Um, so, uh, you know, both of these images showing relationships and, and the intimacy and the human dimension of, of kind of survival uh, during the pandemic and what that meant and all of the things that it um, had thrown into question. Uh, so it was just a thrilling exhibition to see artists um, take on, you know, big social issues as well as these sort of, and, and the way those big social issues, I think, impact us all on such deeply personal levels. So um, that, that, let, let me just end very quickly. This is another extraordinary permanent project that we've just done in partnership with Planet Word, which is an amazing new museum just opened in Washington, D.C. That, that celebrates language. And Raphael Lozano Hemmer has created this interactive sculptural piece called Speaking Willow that when you stand underneath it, it speaks to you but it speaks to you in hundreds of different languages. Each one of these bell forms has its own unique language and they, they come to life as you walk underneath. So it, it creates this wonderful polyphony of the world's cultures and languages. Um, so, uh, so Public Art Fund is, is, is reaching beyond New York City um, we have a fantastic Carmen Herrera show that we presented at City Hall Park last year, now in Houston. Uh, and, and we're excited about uh, not only the, the work that we're able to do in New York, but the opportunity to, to build on that and share it um, around the US uh, as well. And um, Laurie, um, uh, Great to see you. Um, Nicholas, it's so great to see you. Um, Thank so you so much for this talk. My, my pleasure. Um, so I love that you, you know, end with the, the, the planet word because I actually worked at the Women's Museum in DC, which was right next door. That's the building where Alexander Graham Bell first did the test where the voice was heard on the telephone at the Franklin School. Right. So it's so fitting that it's the planet word. It's amazing. So it's so cool to see that. And thank you too. It's like total manna to, 
travel to New York City tonight <laughs> um, and see mm. see artwork out in the city and see some of the places we all miss and love. So thank you so much for that talk. Um, yeah, we've known each other for what, 20 years? <laughs> um, when you brought the fantastic About Face Andy Warhol show to the Miami Art Museum, which was a totally fresh look at Warhol's portraiture. Um, and I just had such a pleasure and I've watched with rap attention your career since. And you've been a total inspiration. You talked about mentorship. I think your career has been an absolute mentorship for myself as well as a curator. Oh, that's and so nice, thank you. I love, I love when you say, you know, you talked about the idea of using the museum as a canvas, but then you also have moved to using the city as a canvas and even a platform. And then your audience is an audience of everyone of every age. And you know, having lived this duality of the museum world and the the world of the pub, of public art and art in the public sphere, I'm just curious, you know, how do you measure success? You talked about like the word trust early on in, in your talk, and you know, how do you navigate success and even know if, if there is a failure? I'm just curious. Um, yeah, that's you know, it's one of those sort of impossible questions. Um, that you have to ask. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, you have to ask it because I think it does bring you back um, to thinking about what your mission is and why you're doing what you're doing. And um, when you're passionate about art and artists and working um, with artists, and when you come from the art world, as I do, um, there's also, um, you know, there's, there's a way you can forget that the, the mission of Public Art Fund is not to serve the art world, it's to serve the general public. And so, you know, if we did something that was successful in the art world, um, but that did not resonate or connect with anyone beyond that world, would that be a success? Um, and, and I think the answer is no. So, um, so I, I think that in a way, um, you know, that's just something important to, to remember, um, but it doesn't, I don't think, I think those two things can work in a very complementary way. Um, and I think the artists that we work with um, also understand that, that this is a different opportunity. You know, um, an artist is gonna do something very different for us and for this opportunity, this context, than they would do for their gallery show or their museum show. Um, and, and I think where we can help artists because of all the experience we have is translating, you know, the, their concept uh, into that sort of public realm. And often in doing that, it, it opens new doors. Artists will, will work with a new material that they haven't worked with before, uh, or they'll, um, you know, think about their work differently and and it's it's I've seen it become so generative as um, uh, as as a way of really just you know offering artists different tools and helping them think uh, about about ways of working that they just wouldn't have wouldn't have occurred before so to me that's a big success mm -hmm. you know has the artist like gotten something out of this that's that's really expanded their horizons. Um, so I think, you know, you have the success for the audience, you have uh, the success for the artist, um, you know, you, you have the success for the media, you know, does it, does it get, did it get attention? Um, you know, there, there are all those different metrics that we can bring and, and, probably no one of them is enough by itself. And I think we, we try and hope that we'll, you know, we'll be able to touch on all of them, not necessarily with every exhibition, 
because we also run a program. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's also about looking at our whole program and, and thinking, you know, have we worked with emerging artists? Have we worked with, you know, mid-career artists? Have we worked with senior artists? Have we worked with, I mean, Art on the Grid was 50 artists from, you know, they're all New York-based artists, but from, I think, well, like, 20 something yeah. countries. You had one of our Miami own Rafael Dominic. Um, he, we, we still claim him. <laughs> Ex exactly. <laughs> and um, New York City is, um, you know, is, is one of the most diverse cities in the world. And, uh, and, and that is a part of our, you know, of our work and our mission as well. Reflecting the city itself. Um, right. That's actually, uh, you talked a little bit about emerging artists and the sort of career span of artists that you work with. And it's a good segue to a question from George Fishman um, to talk about the respective challenges of working with an established artist and younger, less known artists in terms of risk taking, which you were just talking about, um, both theirs and yours. So maybe just carrying a little bit further what you were just talking about. Um. Yeah, look, it, it, is, it is actually uh, kind of a big deal to, you know, get a commission for the public space in New York City um, because... It's, a, it's an, a you've arrived moment. I mean, it's, um, it's a big deal. It's, it's a big deal and um, it's a lot of pressure uh, and... It's also, um, I mean, I think what um, the late Tom Sokolovsky, um, who of course we worked with on the Warhol uh, way back when, um, uh, said to me years ago about working in Hartford, Connecticut, that it was, it was ideal because it was close enough to New York that if you did something good, you know, people would know about it, but that if you do something really terrible, um, no one's no one's going to know about it. Um, you know, in New York, so um, so that was always a bit of a security blanket for taking risks. Um, uh, I don't know how true it was, but but anyway, um, <laughs> it's a good one. You know, the the I guess my point is that if you put a public work up in New York City, you cannot take it back. It's there, it's done, and it has to be, you know, the best thing that you could do. And, and our responsibility is to make sure that we have given the artist, you know, the support that they need to, uh, to achieve that. Whether, and, you know, honestly, an emerging artist or a, a, a really seasoned artist. I mean, um, you know, I mean, we, you know, we've worked with, uh, I mean, you know, um, the, the artists you see in art on the grid, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, we, we also do, you know, this was Ai Weiwei's first public project in New York City. Or did you know Anselm Kiefer's first yeah, that's right. project in New York City? And you know those artists are, uh, in a way, maybe the bigger name makes it even more mm -hmm. pressure. Absolutely, because uh, if they really flub it, well, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. there's a lot more. It's not going to go well. Um, right. So the question that's probably on the mind of quite a few of, of our viewers tonight: um, one of our artists who you're actually and thank you in advance to or here. You've been doing studio visits with Miami artists, six studio visits. Um, and we do this with all of our talks curators. Um, but one of the artists who's coming up with you on Friday is asking, how do artists get involved with the Public Art Fund? Um, well, uh, you know, we, we have a curatorial team. Um, so we function, you know, very much like uh, a, a museum would. 
So, you know, it's not necessarily an open call like a traditional public art program might have. No, we're we're a, not a city or a county. Uh, no, yeah. and and we're not um, a city organization. We're a, we're an independent, not for profit. Um, so we raise raise money for you know our uh, our exhibitions and and funding. Um, of and course, that was actually a question that somebody did ask. Is like even with Ai Weiwei, you know, I saw a Kickstarter out there for Ai Weiwei. Yeah, um, I'm sure that wasn't the sole source of funds, but that was one of the questions too. Is how do you yeah. get your funding? And I know you yeah. and Dennis were talking a little bit about that. Yeah, it's it's true. Um, look, obviously, we work very closely with the city because we're using public space, mm -hmm. um, and you know they they are. I mean, this is a you know real estate is very precious in New York, so we're very privileged to be able to, you know, do the kinds of projects we, we do and, and have a great, you know, partnership with the city. Um, but the vast majority of our funding is, is private. Um, uh, you know, we, um, I think, you know, the, of course, um, Fundraising is is a huge challenge. Um, all the all, you know it, at the best of times, um, and of course we're not in the best of times. So uh, it, it 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 is um, you know it's it's something that's just a, an ongoing challenge for all of us. I think you know we're fortunate in that we've been able to actually continue to do our work and our core mission. Um, so we're very lucky. And we're also very lucky that, um, you know, in, in a sense, um, our model does not rely on uh, any, any user funding. So if you're a museum, you charge admission, or if you're a theater, right. you sell tickets. Um, we just give our stuff away. Like we always have, we always will. That's just what we do. So we haven't lost that income because we never had it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an ongoing challenge and, um, and this, is, this is a very tough year, uh, no question. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I was looking at like even Pope Bell's project, I was thinking about, you know, Pope Bell's project was done before COVID. Um, you know, it was 100 people, how many people, um, 145 crawling across the streets. This is called Conquest. This is a piece that Hope Bell has been doing for years, um, but the biggest in New York. And, and someone asked about the question about challenging ideas and how you navigate that. And, you know, and even with Ai Weiwei dealing with the refugee crisis, um, you know, you talked a little, I was listening in on you and Dennis talking about this moment and, you know, Again, how do we reflect both the city, but also what's in the hearts of, of artists um, and responding to a current moment? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, maybe what's coming up next as we close it out. Yeah. Um, there are real limitations. Um, or let me rephrase that. I don't think of them as limitations. There are parameters. Um, you know, we know that there are things that you can't present in a public space um, where there are, you know, regulations around um, sexual, you know, explicit sexuality, violence, uh, etc. Um, so, you know, as well as just the very mundane practical kinds of considerations like is that weatherproof? You know, is that going to survive all the love that it's going to get from you or know, accessibility the, the public? Yeah. Um, you know, so there are there are parameters that that are very real that are specific to this public art context, but um, I think those. Um, 
in a way, it all comes back to that idea that I kind of began with about artists teaching me that um, their best work comes from a response to a specific context. It doesn't actually come from presenting a tabula rasa. It, it comes from presenting like, here's the opportunity, you know, here are the parameters, what can you do within this? And, and that's, I think that's what really generates the creative dialogue. Um, so, uh, so that's how I think about it. Thank you. Um, I, I was gonna ask you about a little bit about what's next, but someone was asking, Jen Clay was asking um, about a super future next, like will the public art fund move into virtual permanent AR, for example? <laughs> um, you know, we- Or um, other things that rely we on- will, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll go wherever artists the go. The artists take you, yeah. You know, I, that's also how I think about, um, you know, we don't have um, our own kind of agenda. I mean, we have values as an organization. You know, we believe that, that artists' voices should be a part of our civic dialogue and that the city should be a platform for artists to, to share their work. And we believe that everybody, uh, whether you come from a privileged background or one where you've never been introduced to or taken to a museum, that everybody should have access to great art free of charge. So, you know, those are core values. But then, you know, we look to artists um, to, to guide us about, you know, what are they making their work in response to? I didn't go to Ai Weiwei and say, you know, I want you to do um, a really political show about refugees. Um, you know, I said, we, we have this really important opportunity. Um, would you, you know, would you like to take this on and, and what would you do? So um, that, that, that's how we like to, uh, to operate. Love it. And I love the work that you're doing and continue to do. And thank you so much, Nicholas, for doing this with us tonight. Um, I can't wait to come see the works in person and see you in person, hopefully back here in Miami at some point or, or up there in New York. Um, is there anything you want to say before um, I do the last closing? I, I just want to say again, you know, how um, special Miami is to me. Um, I, uh, you know, when I, when I, my first job in the U.S., uh, as Laurie mentioned, she uh, invited me to bring the Warhol exhibition down to Miami. And uh, that was the first exhibition I'd had sort of traveled to another museum. You know, I'd moved from Sydney to Hartford, Connecticut, and um, <laughs> and it was my first visit to Miami. You know, Sydney's quite a tropical, beachy, outdoorsy place, and you know, I got to Miami and I was kind of like, oh, I'm home. Um, so, uh, and we had know. a fabulous dinner at the restaurant Pacific Time on Lincoln I Road, I which I still remember. Um, those were really great days. That was 2000. But then you um, ended up coming back many times. You've done installations um, for Art Basel in the public sphere. Um, so you're as much a part of Miami's and, family and, as... And with Dennis as, and Deborah. Yes. <laughs> you, know, um, you guys have a super long, close history. So yeah, you're, you're yeah. part of the family here. So you're always, our doors right, are always right. open. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna close out and just remind everyone, so this is the end of our talk season for 2020. 2021, the announcement's gonna be coming out soon, but I can tease out that Hamza Walker from Lax Art is gonna be our first of 2021 in February on the 17th of February. And again, thank you for doing the studio visits. It means so much to the artists um, who get to have time with you and, and get insights from you and your ex expertise. And, Really, that's it. Thank you all for tuning in and thank you for 
for doing this with us, Nicholas. It's great to see you. Good night. Great to see you as well. Thanks. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks, Dennis.